So, Peter, there's a couple of things I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Let's start with uh, FINRA. Uh, there's going to be a new uh, head of FINRA, new CEO. What, tell us, first off, wh- what is FINRA? Why, why should people care about it? FINRA is the quote-unquote self-regulatory organization. It's called an SRO. That is essentially, it's the fox guard in the hen house. Uh, it is the securities industry own regulatory body that oversees, under the umbrella of the SEC, the day-to-day activities of Wall Street, the registered representatives, also known as financial advisors. So why it would be important to anybody on Main Street is when you go to see your financial advisor for advice on your life savings, the uh, the regulator overseeing Wall Street and that financial advisor is FINRA to make sure you're pr- treated pr- uh, and, and protected, treated fairly, and that your life savings is protected. And the advice you get is the best advice and, and conflict-free advice you can. So FINRA is the body that, that makes sure that that happens. But it's, it's, quite frankly, run by the securities industry. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, is there a... Um, I mean, I imagine there's analogs when we see, you know, something like um, maybe there are, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a meat industry organizations that right. uh, are <laughs> responsible for overseeing the uh, the quality of meat and the fact that um, uh, meat processing plants maybe are uh, up to code. But my understanding is like, you know, the FDA theoretically will send in agents. Right. I mean, what what? What is the deal with FINRA? I mean, let's. I mean, before we talk about specifically who's now heading it, in the main, is this a body that can actually even function to really serve the interests of the, uh, I guess, financial consumer in the country? And sort of a subsidiary question. I could tell why you're laughing where that's going. Right. But a subsidiary question: What's the relationship with, say, something like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Uh, the newest sort of agency uh, established, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren had originally set mm-hmm. it up, um, that is a government agency. What is the relationship, the dynamic there between uh, the CFPB and FINRA? I mean, at the end of the day, the regulator that's in charge of the securities industry is the SEC. However, the lack of transparency uh, about what kind of oversight of FINRA and any federal agency Uh, over the securities industry, over Wall Street, no one knows. I mean, at the end of the day, if you wanted to find out, if I wanted to find out almost any industry in the country, as far as like through a FOIA request or asking about what type of oversight is is inflicted on that specific industry, we could get that information. In the securities industry, there's a very little known carve out that is exempt from FOIA requests about what the SEC does, what the other agencies do to oversee the securities industry. And that lack of transparency, to me, is disturbing. So at at the end of the day, uh, FINRA is the agency that oversees uh, the the actual kind of Wall Street firms, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Lehman Brothers, you name it. And the issue to me is, is, is FINRA capable? What do they do? They're filled with people with good intentions. They're filled with people that, uh, at the end of the day, that the primary goal is investor protection. But the problem is FINRA is filled to the gills with folks that had previous careers in defense firms. It's called the revolving door. So at the end of the day, the regulators are attorneys, our employees, investigators who came from the defense industry. Once again, a gentleman by the name of Robert Cook, who's just been identified as the new CEO of FINRA, spent 18 years. I mean, think about that. 18 years, his entire career defending Wall Street firms, and now he's in charge of investor protection. So if you think about it, in any regulatory investigation, He is now sitting on the opposite side of the table than his old partners at his old law firm, clearly Gottlieb, that he was with for 18 years, defending the same guys that, or I'm sorry, prosecuting the same guys that he's defending. And and it's like this over and over and over again. We're seeing the same individuals at the SEC, at FINRA, at all of the federal agencies that a year earlier, six months earlier, we're defending the same people they're now over. It doesn't work. And for once, just one time, could we get someone from the other side of the aisle, whether it be the plaintiff's bar, whether it be someone truly with the mission of investor protection, 
to take this role and see what we could do to clean up Wall Street. But once again, we grab somebody from the defense side of the aisle. It doesn't work. We've, we've identified that numerous times. And we should say, we should explain this. The, the, the theory behind this is because um, these are all his friends that he's going to be sitting right. across. And, the, you know, human nature is human nature. Uh, you're not all of a sudden going to throw off all of your social circles, all of your professional circles, and, uh, and be aggressive with them in certain points. And you also, I mean, so let me ask you this. So there's the inherent problem of, of getting someone who has been essentially who is steeped in all the reasons why someone shouldn't be prosecuted mm -hmm. becoming the prosecutor. But let me, let me get a sense of what you would predict. What happens with Mr. Cook? Does Mr. Cook end his career at FINRA? Uh, or, or, or does his career, does he have a career after FINRA? If he, I, I'll tell you what, it's a very, very highly paid position at FINRA. It's uh, well over seven figures. Um, it, it would not be, uh, I mean, it, it, it would, easy to stay in that role at FINRA and take that job and, and run it for the next several years and ride into the sunset. But if he did choose to go back to the private sector, there's an awfully big payday working, waiting for him there. So whichever way he goes, he's, he's solid. I mean, as far as his financial set, he can either go back to the private side and defend and coming from the regulator, he would be highly sought after and worth several million dollars a year. Or he could stay at FINRA and ride off into the sunset as his predecessors and knocking down, you know, well over a million dollars a year as the chief, uh, the, the chief of FINRA. So he's set either way he goes. What has what, what FINRA's uh, record been up to this point? Because uh, as far as I can tell, they're getting criticized from, um, uh, from all different directions. Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost laughable that, uh, that, that FINRA is getting uh, – uh, chastised or questioned from from Wall Street and from business. I mean, you, you've got to be kidding me. How many times do we have to go back through, whether it be the 2000 to 02 analyst debacle, the 08 mortgage conflict ridden crisis that was self driven, self made by greed? Now, for instance, we've got examples like Puerto Rico. I mean, FINRA is a day late and a dollar short. This, the, the, these, it's absolutely incredible that the whole model of Wall Street is driven by conflicts. You've got three examples in the last 15 years that people lose their life savings, and we're doing nothing to put someone in these positions that actually thinks and sees investor rights first. So, Peter, let's, what happened this week in terms of uh, Puerto Rico head to the Supreme Court what were they looking? What were they looking for from the the courts? The, the courts were what was being decided was whether who controlled the destiny, who controlled the outcome of the uh, seventy two billion dollars worth of Puerto Rican debt that the government of Puerto Rico, what's called GO bonds, general obligation, who could control a uh, the the distribution and an orderly. Uh, kind of organization of the defaults that Puerto Rico is already going through. And as of July, $1.9 billion in additional uh, uh, principal and interest payments will be defaulted on. They were looking to the courts to give some direction about, you know, typically if you were a state like Jefferson or a, a municipality like Jefferson County, Alabama, that went through bankruptcy, you would look to the bankruptcy uh, laws for, for that organization and kind of stop, hit the pause button, and and have an orderly uh, kind of uh, distribution of bonds and assets and income. Well, we, Puerto Rico doesn't have the protection. There is no protection of the bankruptcy. So they were looking to the courts to give some direction about how to do that. And the courts pretty much said, you know what, we're not going to get in the middle of this. So now it's back in Congress's lap. They, quite frankly, the answer is relatively simple. Um, if you would just give the Puerto Rican government the same uh, protections we have in the states, um, and forget all the colonialism questions about the U.S. and a territory. If the Puerto Rican government wants to declare bankruptcy like any state or municipality would on the mainland, give them the opportunity to do that so when they default, it's not complete chaos. And that's the scary part is, is that a lot of this falls on uh, regular mom-and-pop investors. It's not just the, the, you know, the vultures that you mentioned, which – good riddance to let them figure out what to do. But a lot of this is grandma and grandpa that are using this uh, this money to pay their electric bills and buy food and uh, make their car payments and their mortgage payments and their rent. And that's the really, really tr huge travesty with this.
So, all right. So explain uh, that. The, the, how do the grandma and grandpa, how do they have a stake Absolutely. in this? And, and I should say, like, so basically Puerto Rico goes to the courts and says, can you give us um, some uh, framework that is like a cousin right. to bankruptcy, essentially? Right. Because right? Right? we need we have all this debt. Uh, we need protection from our creditors. We don't have the money to pay it off. And we just don't know who should get the money first or how we should decide or when we have to start paying back or can we do 25 cents on the dollar or whatever it right, is. Exactly. Uh, and the courts basically said, no, nope, we can't answer this question for you because there's no law right. that exists for you uh, because you don't have bankruptcy. Uh, and so you got to go to Congress to get some type of relief. So who is it? So when you say it's mom and uh, pop or, uh, you know, uh, it's because they own. Uh, a 401k or they own some type of uh, so re- retirement fund or something uh, that or just the has... individual bonds. Okay. And so they own the bonds mm-hmm. uh, for Puerto Rico. Right. And so uh, how did Puerto Rico get into this mess? I mean, I, uh, give me the abbreviated version. $72 billion worth of debt in Puerto Rico and an island of $3.6 million. Put that in perspective. That's the size of Chicago or Houston, $72 billion. The only mainland states that have more debt than Puerto Rico are, for instance, like California and New York that have multiples uh, of people and Puerto Rico does. So way too much debt for the small island. How did they accrue that much debt? It, over time, they were there with budget deficits, and it's almost like your kid going off to college with a credit card. Puerto Rico kept borrowing more and more and more to pay the shortfalls with the budget shortfalls and their their uh, their vital services, and they just kept borrowing money to pay their bills. Well, over time, that just that you should it just the the, the line the graph up goes straight up over the last 10, 15 years. They just kept issuing bonds. But what's most, and why this ties back into the FINRA story we were just talking about, at the end of the day, uh, the underwriters, the UBSs, the Santanders, the Banca Populars that dominated the island, uh, the underwriting scene on the island, they were giving advice to the bond issuers, whether it be the government, whether it be utilities, whether it be the retirement system, about the wisdom of continuing to issue bonds. And over, and so they could make the underwriting fees. These firms like Santander kept telling them, hey, good job, keep issuing, this is what you want to do, this is wise, this is sound financial strategy. Because they knew, as part of the underwriting syndicate, they could give the advice to issue the bonds, and then they in turn could use their distribution channels to sell those bonds to their own clients, meaning they took the risk of uh, taking those bonds into their inventory, into their proprietary accounts like Santander, and then shifted that risk onto its own retail clients by using its distribution channels. And while all this is going on, clearly obvious then that their own clients are concentrated in these investments, this, the regulators, like FINRA we were just talking about, are asleep at the wheel when 50, 60, 70% of the assets under management are in Puerto Rican debt issued by the Wall Street firms and then sold to their own clients, all to generate and gin up the fees. So this is like almost a a perfect analog. We had David Dayan on uh, a week or two ago about his book, Chain of Title. This is sort of a a perfect analog to what happened in the the mortgage crisis. Oh, it's it's uh, the same story. uh, uh, Basically, unscrupulous lenders who are just going to collect the fees. Right. They're not even taking the risk because they're turning around and basically dumping this toxic assets because anybody with a pulse could see that this is an unsustainable debt. I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, $70 billion for, for, for 3 million people. I mean, th- it's, that's just, it's unsustainable. It's ludicrous. And, and there is a fiduciary responsibility right. as a bank to basically say, like, we can't issue uh, bad loans to you because this right. is why we have loan officers. It, it's, we, this, it's, go it, ahead. Sam, it's so disgusting. What? Let's just take Santander, for instance. We San, just got 60 seconds. Santander is one of the largest banks in the world. Santander was dumping its own Puerto Rican exposure in 12 and 13, before the Puerto Rican decline in August and September of 13. They took their own Puerto Rican dis- dis- uh, uh, exposure in their proprietary and house accounts to zero. They had an action plan. They took themselves to zero, and they have an uh, internal risk system for bonds. Green, yellow, red. Red, the highest risk, of course. They never changed the risk rating for their retail clients and their own financial advisors, mm. took their own exposure to, z- exposure to zero, and left their own clients they owe the fiduciary duty to 
in the crappy Puerto Rican bonds and let them bear the brunt of the decline, all the while protecting itself. And it happened everywhere on that island, all while the regulators, who were all from the defense side of the table, sat and watched it happen. And only afterwards do they come and do something. It's the same story. It's, it's the same story every five years. Unbelievable. Well, uh, I guess we'll have to see what uh, what Congress does if they're planning to do anything. Uh, but uh, we got we, we got to talk to you again about this story because obviously it's ongoing. And now uh, the SEC is starting to investigating uh, those banks that are turning around and selling these bonds that they knew were basically ticking time bombs. And fraud's cheap. They do it again and again. They know it's cheaper to pay the fine and face the regulators than it is to uh, to uh, stop to stop doing, doing the conduct. It's made two, UBS made two billion dollars on that island issuing these bonds. Two billion. Unbelievable. They got fined like thirty thirty million dollars. Drop in the bucket. Peter Mouget, uh, thanks for your time today. Thank really you, appreciate Sam. it.